you understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. The resistance. We are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. It's a trap. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. I'm so excited to be here with you today. I've got a very special guest. His name is Lawrence Reed, and he is very well-respected, and he's very well thought of in the world of freedom fighters and young patriots. Mr. Reed, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Hey, thank you, TJ. It's a pleasure. Well, uh, I've got a couple reasons that I wanted to have you on, but one of the most prominent would be because of the, well, there's the pamphlet, there's fee.org, which you run. There was Freedom Fest in 2013. That's kind of when you first popped on my radar. And as I dove into the writings that you've penned and also some of the ones that you've recommended, I, I'm fascinated by the historical aspect of great civilizations and their rise and corresponding fall. I think you could make the case, which you have, that we're in the middle of one of those today. So I'd really like to talk to you a little bit about Rome okay. and some of the insightful things that you've said about it. And I really want to kind of go further and compare those things to exactly what we're seeing today, because uh, I don't think the comparisons are that hard to make, but it's enjoyable to see how similar they run. So before we do that, tell me a little bit about your history and your upbringing and how you, what kind of molded your political thinking and your education and those types of things. Okay, I'd be happy to. I came from a family that was not particularly politically aware or interested my father was a uh, small businessman. My mother was a housewife. My mother, I don't think, ever really got very interested in, in political or current uh, policy issues, but my father had the right instincts. I can recall way back in 1964, I would have been 11, uh, coming home from school and saying a few things about what my teacher had said, that everybody should be for Lyndon Johnson, and my dad hit the ceiling <laughs> he was uh, staunchly for Barry Goldwater. But it was not until 1966 when uh, my mother took my sister and I to go see The Sound of Music that um, an interest in history began to develop. I didn't want to see the movie. I didn't like the sound of it. And, you know, after all, I was young enough that uh, I had plenty of other things I'd rather be doing than watch The Sound of Music. But my mother took my sister and I up to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we saw it, and it really hit me. She had told me that it was a true story, and so I watched it with that in mind, and I think it was the first time in my life that I realized that people elsewhere in the world uh, do not live as freely as we do, and I wanted to learn more about the history of pre-World War II, uh, Europe in particular, because of uh, the message of the movie. And so I devoured everything I could uh, for the next couple of years, and I developed a, uh, a strong distaste for authoritarianism of any kind. Then in 1968, when Prague Spring began to develop in Czechoslovakia, I was watching that uh, glued to the TV set every night, uh, cheering on the Czechs as they talked about the possibility of even having free elections and freeing up the country in so many ways. Then when the Soviets invaded in August of 68, I got really uh, fired up. And within a few days, I saw an ad in the local paper about a demonstration that Young Americans for Freedom were going to have in Pittsburgh against the Soviet invasion. Uh, I went to Pittsburgh uh, again, joined in on that demonstration. We burned the Soviet flag at that time. And uh, I joined YAF, and at that time, new members always got a subscription to the Freeman, which is the publication of Fee, the organization I now run, as uh, well as some other important books to read, like Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson and Hayek's Road to Serfdom. And the message was, if you want to be a good anti-communist, uh, you have to be more than just opposed to tanks and invasions. You've got to know your economics and your philosophy, and your uh, moral principles. And so from there, I developed uh, uh, my thinking further, became a professor of economics at Northwood University in Michigan, and later uh, the first president and president for 21 years of the Mackinac Center, public policy group uh, in Michigan, and then uh, became president of FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education, in 2008, and that's the job I've held since. So was that rally in Pittsburgh, was that when you were christened as a, as a right-wing 
radical nut job? Is that really when it all started? Yeah, I guess. Is that when you got on Obama's F- enemies list? Well, it might well have been, but I, I do recall uh, getting that epithet from a few corners at that time <laughs> that I joined in with a bunch of right-wingers. Imagine that, opposing uh, uh, the Soviet invasion somehow uh, got me the label of being a, a radical. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that'll do it. You are officially a terrible person. You walk through that doorway and you can't go back. I guess so. <laughs> it's a fascinating history. I, you know, I was thinking, as you mentioned, your teacher discussing Lyndon Johnson. I thought, you know, that's not, did you ever have to say, uh, Lyndon, what was this? Lyndon B. Johnson. Mm, mm, mm. Was that a song that was sang back then? Or is that kind of a new thing? I, I don't recall. And I, I don't think at that point I was personally yet all that interested in the election. I had just mentioned to my father that that's what the teacher said. Um, so it would uh, remain for a few years before my interest in, in politics really picked up. It's just the, the thought that I had is that you can draw some parallels between the fact that even back then teachers were pushing for the, uh, the strong Democratic candidate. But look what's happened now, which same thing that happened to Lyndon Johnson, where his party kind of abandoned him towards the end. It's uh, relevant to our discussion today about history repeating itself. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And if anything, of course, uh, the teachers' unions... Uh, which have really radicalized uh, education, uh, they are so heavily democratic these days that uh, a teacher who is not of that persuasion often feels the need to keep quiet. So, and where did you, where were you raised? What part of the country? In western Pennsylvania, in a little town of uh, Beaver Falls, about 30 miles north of Pittsburgh. Okay. So my grandmother, who I spoke with via email yesterday, she grew up in basically Los Angeles most of her life. They still live there in the Seal Beach area. And she was a teacher and she was writing me yesterday and said, you know, if I had stayed on for a couple more years, my salary would be almost double what it is in retirement. And I won't mention what hers is, but it's it's sizable. It'd be hard to earn in today's economy. And she mentioned she has friends who taught history and science and physical education, home economics, which of course is now defunct who are pulling down over $100,000 a year per piece. And she said, we have Jerry Brown to thank for that. And I, you know, I wasn't alive at the time, but I thought it really is a vote buying machine when you can get these people who are now retired to have been taught that they are entitled to hundreds of thousands of dollars for not working. Whereas, you know, I've got a great professional job in my career and it's very difficult to earn that kind of money as a professional. And it, it, you know, and she said, Jerry Brown, we have to thank. Well, now he's back and he's, he's back to his old antics. At some point, the house of cards is going to come down. And my grandmother is realistic. She said, you know, <laughs> thanks for the social security. We know that you're not, it's not going to be around for you, but it's a strange world that we live in where that system was put in place and has survived as long as it has. It says a lot about how wealthy of a country we are or we were. That's right. And you know, in a genuinely free market, the really good teachers might well command salaries in excess of 100000 Agreed. But the problem is in today's world, uh, government education anyway, is dominated by tenure, by all kinds of uh, artificial protections, uh, by a leveling mentality that doesn't like to reward the very best, tries to treat everybody the same, bad teachers as good as the good ones. And I think that in the long run uh, is, is excessively costly and it, uh, it's very counterproductive. We don't end up with uh, a very good educational system as a result. Probably a lot of overpaid teachers because of it. Yeah, like a lot of the government programs, look at what our money bought us. Just have to ask some very easy questions about whether or not we got a good return especially in California. I mean, it's, I still go out and visit quite a bit, but I, I, unlike when I was young, when I thought that would be a dream to live there, I've, I've wisened up just a little bit. It is nice to visit though. Well, in the past 30 years, uh, education spending in real terms has more than doubled, but uh, test scores have uh, at best been flat, if not declining. Let's talk a little bit about Rome. And you have a fantastic packet or booklet that you send out. There's a lot of information on the fee.org website, which I will link to in the podcast. But what I really want to do is draw the strongest and not necessarily the easiest correlations, but the most prominent among them, how we can really tell that we're living in a world that's that's already come, existed, and toppled. And before I do that, I want to talk about, I read David Horowitz's book recently, Take No Prisoners. And he talks about how if you are a progressive or a digressive, as I refer to him, or a statist, you refer history has no use for you at all because you just assume that they were lesser men 
with smaller ambitions and they just missed the mark. So you can just try it again and get it right. Whereas you quote some of the, even the Roman historians saying that, you know, history is so rich in lessons for us, we get to choose who we want to be, who we want to emulate. So uh, I have some very direct questions I want to ask you about it, but give us an overview of the similarities between the USA and Rome. Okay. Well, ancient Rome really spans a thousand years, about 500 years as a republic, uh, and then 500 years as an imperial autocracy or empire run by uh, uh, very powerful dictators, emperors. And the birth of Christ occurred uh, roughly right uh, smack in the middle of that. I think the greatest parallels uh, between America and Rome go back to the days of the Republic. By the time of the Empire, uh, it was a very different, uh, nasty place, and uh, that's the kind of outcome I hope Americans can still avoid. But at the earliest uh, stages of uh, the birth of Rome and the birth of uh, America, there are a lot of similarities. We both revolted against uh, monarchy, uh, we against the British and the Romans against the Etruscans. And then in both, both cases, once the monarchs were overthrown, the people were so fed up with one-man rule that they established a republic. In the case of Rome, uh, there was no one position at the very top. They established two positions called consuls. They wanted power divided at the top between two men. Each could veto the decisions of the other, and there were term limits imposed on them. They had one year, and that's all they could serve. Then they had to step down, and someone else uh, would be named, uh, two people would be named as consul. They also, at the same time, in ancient Rome, established uh, representative assemblies, the Senate, Admittedly, it represented uh, noble families primarily, uh, and, uh, but they also had popular assemblies that were uh, elected by those who were allowed to vote. It was by no means a perfect uh, republic, and they always had slavery as well. But they took freedom uh, to a higher level for more people across society than any peoples had done before. And then, of course, uh, nothing like it would, be, would happen again until the birth of America in 1776. The problem with ancient Rome, though, is that they couldn't keep the republic, that it faded after about uh, 500 years. The last 100 years of the republic were riven with strife, conflict, the rise of a, a welfare state, politicians increasingly trying to buy the support of uh, Roman people with uh, their own money, uh, that is, the, the money of the people themselves. And uh, that's very similar to what's happening today. Uh, maybe last night in the elections, uh, uh, you know, we made a, a new turn in the right direction. Let's see. But uh, in any event, um, we've been following a lot of that same path of the growth of a welfare state, the centralization of power, and the loss of individual liberty, the same path that Rome took that ultimately extinguished its republic. It's interesting for me as someone who, uh, you know, I wasn't always political either. It's It's been a slow process, but I like to try to look at it rationally and say, all right, if I'm going to give someone the benefit of the doubt, if I'm going to Bill O'Reilly and go, hey, you know, they're, they're not trying to hurt anybody. They don't, they think they're doing the right thing. I always ask the question, either they don't know or they don't care. And that's kind of one of the, the trump cards I like to pull out during debates is, you know, when people do these very misguided things, I just want to know, do they not know or do they not care? And so as I look at the history of some of the Roman leaders and the things they did, what litmus test do you give people when they're to determine if they're unintentionally or intentionally limiting freedoms and as a result hurting people? You have to get a good sense for a person's character, uh, whether they really have the best interests of uh, the general population in mind or whether they're in politics uh, for the love of power. Uh, because it's the love of power that causes people to do a lot of things that are uh, very destructive to others in the long run, even though it may allow them to flourish and to uh, gain power in the short run. Uh, you take a politician like Harry Reid, for instance. I think time and again, uh, he's shown himself to be a man of a pretty lousy character. He is uh, a living example of what uh, Lord Acton warned us about, that power corrupts, Absolute power corrupts absolutely, and I always like to add my own corollary to that. Power tends to attract the already corrupted. Lord Acton would be impressed. He would be flattered. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think he would. I think he would agree with me, too. 
this is one of the problems of big government that our side doesn't argue um, or doesn't present often enough. Every every day, practically, you run into people who complain about how lo- politics is so dirty, so nasty that good people don't want to go into it uh, any longer. Well, this is this is natural and it's inevitable. The bigger the government gets, the more it distri- redistributes other people's money, the more the power is concentrated, the more that uh, good people wash their hands of it. Uh, the, who who wants who you know what good person wants to have his name dragged through the mud? Uh, for a political position. So good people in fewer numbers run for office, the bigger the government gets. So we end up with uh, the dirtbags and the power seekers and the short-term thinking people, the ones who are in it uh, for their own power and notoriety and not for the good of the country in the long haul. Take us back to Rome and talk about that progression or digression, that, that series of events as it happened in Roman times. I think the decline of the Roman Republic really began with the early stirrings of a welfare state. And in some cases, uh, those stirrings uh, came from people with good intentions. They wanted to take care of people, uh, or they wanted to redistribute land because they thought that uh, uh, through political favors, uh, the wealthy had made... Uh, a killing on public lands, and there was a good argument for this, and that something had to be done about it. But the problem is, when you start trying to fix problems like that by going down a welfare state path, you start a process that is very destructive and very hard to unwind. Once you start saying to some people, hey, uh, the government now is not just uh, here to protect the peace, it's here to get you something, then more and more people say, hey, why shouldn't I be entitled to something from the government? So it can start small, but it picks up steam as people begin to say, hey, I'd rather vote for a living than work for one. And as long as the government is in the business of passing out goodies, I want to get in line. This really gathered steam in the first century uh, B.C., in the 100s, uh, century before Christ. There was a man by the name of Clodius who ran for the office of Tribune uh, early in this process on a platform of free wheat for the masses, and he won. And by the time of Christ, about a third of the people of the city of Rome itself were receiving uh, the benefits in the form of the dole uh, in grain from the central government. And within a hundred years uh, after that, uh, whenever the Senate tried to restore the Republic after the uh, death of an emperor, it was quite apparent that the people didn't uh, have an appetite anymore uh, for liberty and for Republican values. Instead, they were happy to have a strong man who would get them goodies. Do we know who Clodius ran against for that election, by chance? Oh, I'm sure we do. I couldn't tell you the name at the moment, but I think that uh, is a historical episode that's well documented. I just can imagine, like, let's say it was you, and I, I can hear him saying, Lawrence hates hungry people. <laughs> yeah, you must hate hungry people. Yeah, I, that would have been hilarious, but it seems to work. Apparently it did. Yeah, yeah, it did. Now, there were strong voices against this growing trend. Uh, Cicero comes to mind. He was uh, a man who, he was born in eight, uh, 106 B.C., and so he was very much around during m- most of that last century of the Republic. He stood four square and very bravely in favor of uh, the old Republican values and fought against the, uh, the growing centralization of power. But he was ultimately assassinated in 43 B.C., and that was really the end of the Roman Republic. He was the last significant voice in opposition uh, to uh, uh, dictatorship. Can you tell us the circumstances of his ass- I mean, apparently if he's speaking up against power— He's got to go. But how? what happened to him specifically? Uh, Cicero had a long history from his 20s of opposing concentrations of power, opposing the powerful, first as a lawyer, and then later uh, he won every post for which you could be elected all the way up to uh, the top position of consul. He won that in uh, 63 B.C., and in, within months of his becoming uh, co-consul, most powerful man in Rome, uh, along with his, his uh, co-consul, uh, he faced a conspiracy led by a senator named Catiline uh, to extinguish the Republic. And Catiline conspired to assassinate both consuls, much of the Senate, and take power. But Cicero exposed the plot, and the Senate very briefly gave him extraordinary powers to help uh, uh, snuff it out. 
which he did, and then he promptly returned power to the people, and he left office after that one year as consul. Uh, but the problem was Rome by that time was uh, full of corruption. The old Republican values had been thoroughly corrupted by the welfare state, increasing concentrations of special interests, seeking things from the government. It was in uh, uh, 43 B.C. when Caesar, uh, of course, was assassinated. Um, I may be off by a year, but thereabouts. And in the wake of Caesar's assassination, Mark Antony conspires for control. And that's when Cicero comes out of retirement and delivers uh, 14 fantastic speeches that are known to this day as uh, the Philippics. And in those speeches, he condemned Antony as a would-be dictator. He stood strongly for the restoration of Republican liberties. But Antony had other things in mind, and he sent an assassin to uh, kill Cicero, which he finally did that very year, December of 43 B.C. He's on the enemies list. you got to be careful. Once you step over that line, you can't go back. As a matter of fact, uh, he was named by Antony, quote, an enemy of the state. <laughs> Classic. And, yeah, that is, uh, he was decapitated. Wow. Yeah, Cheryl Atkinson better be careful on her book tour. I was listening to her today and thought, you know, she <laughs> called, what it, What was the name of her book? I could look it up, but that's cheating. I think it was something about the, uh, you might have to help me out here, the... Oh, I forget the title. Intimidation, Yeah. the harassment, and the corruption of the Obama administration or something, working in that environment. I know I got it wrong, but I thought... Some very shady things were happening to her computer. Yeah, yeah. That's back like when you used to call AOL support and the thing would just start doing whatever it wanted to. It's It's bad. It's bad news. Yeah, But it, it speaks to the overall tone of people who are obsessed with power. Like you said, most of them are already corrupted. And my belief in any government institution, including the federal government itself or the, you know, the Roman rulers, is that their main goal is self-preservation. And that's it. Everything else comes secondary, tertiary, or, or further down the line. That's right. And that can lead them many times to do things that are very harmful to the country, very harmful for the long run. Uh, but are beneficial to them just for the short run because they're only thinking of themselves. Let's talk a little bit about the signs, the tea leaves. I know that in your booklet, you mentioned the credit crisis. You mentioned uh, Domitian. Am I saying that right? Uh, Domitian. Domitian. Destroying vineyards, you know, cur <laughs> calling his inner Franklin Roosevelt. Yep. And also debasing the currency. Kind of take us through some of the, the highlights and, and basically signs of the times of when a republic is on its way to demise. Okay. Well, in Rome, the Republic uh, finally ended with Cicero's death, but there were uh, attempts later to restore it, and certainly the first emperor, Augustus, uh, although he didn't restore the Republic, he never did away with the Senate, and in fact, he didn't call himself emperor. Uh, instead, he tried to keep the trappings uh, of, of republicanism while concentrating power in his own hands. So you might say that for a while, even under Augustus, there was a chance that maybe uh, there could be a resurgence of the old republic, but that didn't happen. What did happen was that one emperor after the other looked for ways to further concentrate power uh, and wealth in his hands. Uh, in 33 uh, AD, there was a, a financial panic that gripped Rome, and the government responded to it with a massive issuance of zero-interest credit which sounds a lot like what the Federal Reserve did in our day hmm. within the last the six years. Yeah, that, that did sound familiar. I'm trying to think about that a little bit. And a lot of the businesses uh, that were recipients of the zero-interest credit, um, I'm sure welcomed it, but were uh, ensnared in the, the whole process. And before long, uh, the fact that they took the subsidies made them dependent upon government and the object later of confiscation and, and nationalization. So there was a steady growth of the state at the expense of the private sector through the first uh, 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 several emperors, and it really uh, uh, picked up steam through the rest of them until Rome was extinguished itself in 476 A.D. You mentioned Domitian. He was a Roman emperor who, in the year 91 A.D., ordered the, the uh, destruction of the, half of the vineyards in the provinces in order to raise the price of wine. Uh, which is very much similar to what Franklin Roosevelt did with the AAA program in the mid-1930s. Uh, there was another hallmark in this whole process when Emperor Aurelian, that was in 274 A.D., Aurelian declared the right to relief or welfare payments hereditary. 
So if you were receiving benefits from the government, uh, or your parents were, now as a matter of right, hereditary right, you were uh, uh, now entitled to them, and so were your children. Uh, and then in 301 AD, the Emperor Diocletian, in an effort to deal with this, the, uh, the massive inflation caused by uh, the coining of cheap money uh, from cheap metals, he imposed comprehensive wage and price controls and froze everybody in their occupations. So if you were, a, let's say, a, a butcher or a baker, you could not change professions. You were frozen into it uh, by the emperor. The economy by the um, 4th century uh, AD in Rome was thoroughly regimented, completely socialized, and uh, uh, from there Rome just uh, fell apart and was easy prey for invading barbarians who essentially took it over in 476 AD. And there you have it. And, you know, actually, one question I have for you is if Barack Obama had been there, and he had worked his way up. You know, if there was some populist community organizer movement and he said, you know what, it really bothers me that some certain people in areas of Rome are not getting the lending rates that I want. So I want to make a community reinvestment act and make sure they can get cheap money, even if they can't afford their houses. And let's say he rose up the ranks under some scheme like that and became an emperor. Who would he have most in common with? Which emperor would he, you know, like to go out on the weekends with and just find kind of a, a kinship with? Well, I think it would probably probably be Augustus. Uh, the first of the emperors, because Augustus was very much in love with himself. Uh, he thought he was the savior of Rome. He thought he could do no wrong. But at least he was smart enough not to uh, you know, call out the army and shut down every aspect of Roman liberty. He kept the Senate in place, but pretty much uh, tried to either bully it or, or ignore it uh, at every chance. I think he, Obama would have a lot in common uh, with Augustus. Okay. And that had nothing to do with sexual proclivities, for those of you who know Roman history. It's just a straight question about authoritarianism. So I want to clear that up right now. I want to go to what happens after the Roman Republic falls apart, because we see the signs here. We know that we're, we're basically, we've got a tiger by the tail. We're going in the wrong direction. You know, Mitt Romney's Mormon, and a lot was made of that. For people who haven't read the Book of Mormon, if you look at it, you know, there's strong feelings from people who don't agree with Mormons, but it's interesting to note that in the Book of Mormon, from a secular perspective, it talks about a civilization that was ruled by kings and then was a free people under judges, and eventually the civilization collapsed for very much the same reasons that we see in Roman times. And so what they do is they go on to explain what happened afterwards and how people basically formed tribes and made agreements with each other and tried to rebuild what had been lost. I want to talk to you about the Roman Empire and what you predict what happened in America should things get to the point that they did in Rome? Well, uh, we do know that when Rome collapsed and was overtaken barbarians, it, it ushered in uh, the era we know in history as the Dark Ages. Uh, I'm one of those historians who think that the conventional view of the Dark Ages is probably a little darker than uh, they actually were, but it was still a time of, of, um, of the collapse of the uh, standard of living, uh, of uh, rampant uh, disease and uh, local tyrannies. It was, it was a dark time compared to the, uh, the heydays of, of ancient Rome. America is in such uh, a similar position that Rome was in its early days, in that it was it's sort of the light of the world. It's what people were for a long time were looking to, as, uh, as Reagan would say, the city on the hill. Uh, the one country where individual liberty was cherished and uh, and preserved, the place that uh, much of the rest of the world wanted to move to. When all of that is uh, gone, if that sh should happen here, uh, then uh, we could enter another Dark Ages. I mean, who else in the world at the moment looks to be uh, such a historical defender of liberty as the United States has been? And if we're not able to sustain our liberties, and to be a beacon for the rest of the world, I fear for what uh, uh, the subsequent Dark Ages might look like. Talk to us about some of the issues that are pushed as, well, they call them, you know, good ideas or necessary ideas, but really some of the pillars of progressive ideology, one of them being public school. I read in your booklet that uh, that's interesting because nowadays you can be punished for trying to public school your kids. In Germany, you know, you can be uh, recalled. Or I, I don't know what exactly is going on with that situation now. But I want to know about some of the things that were not originally in Rome that led to the fall of the civilization that are 
ideas that are always being discussed. You've got the war on women, you've got gun control, you've got homeschooling. Talk to us about some of those ones that were prominent in the fall of the empire in Rome. Okay, you mentioned education in particular. Uh, the ancient Greeks uh, had government schools uh, uh, all along, and they looked down at the, at the Romans for much of uh, early history, thinking that uh, all the Romans were rather primitive because they didn't have government schools. The first uh, 400 years of the Roman Republic was a time of private education, home education. Romans were schooled in the home, and it wasn't until very late in the Republic when uh, you had schools in in any sizable way at all, and even then, uh, many of them did not receive uh, government funding. So uh, I think we've got in Rome a society that rose to greatness uh, in part because uh, the virtues of uh, self-discipline and respect for uh, uh, parental authority and and also for individual responsibility and enterprise were all taught uh, very strictly and strongly in the homes. And education was not uh, handed over to the government as a responsibility of the politicians. That was a virtue in ancient Rome. And I'm certain that uh, the rise of government-influenced or government-run education was coincident uh, with the decline of, uh, of those virtues. One thing you can count on is that the government and government schools will never uh, teach either liberty or character. And without those two things or an understanding of them, you can't expect a free society uh, uh, to flourish. Character is something you talk a lot about. And as someone who, you know, I was, I was born in 1980, so the Clinton administration was not really something I was paying a lot of attention to. But now that Lewinsky's come back out and basically talked about how all these people, all these outside influences really hurt her and ruined her life and ruined this beautiful thing that she thought she had, uh, I think a lot about character. I think about what what kind of character it would take to take advantage of this foolish woman and essentially ruin her life and think nothing of it. I think of the character of her to come back out and basically not see this for what it is and the kinds of mental exercises that would have to get a person to the point where this is their reality. And that's what scares me about civilization as a whole is like I'm reading about the American Revolution and about how few of the people were actually willing to stand up and fight for their freedom, to look at what they had and say, you know what, this is worth making the ultimate sacrifice. You're probably familiar. Well, actually, let's talk about the character thing first. Then I want to ask you another question about the, the small percentage of people willing to do what's necessary. Okay. Uh, you're right, TJ, that character is a very important aspect of what we do at FEE. And in fact, it figures into some work we've done on the subject we just addressed, uh, namely Rome. Uh, your uh, listeners can go to fee.org slash Rome and uh, see a lot of uh, uh, material dealing not just with ancient Rome, but the decline of character. I think that the connection between liberty and character is absolutely indispensable. Those two things are are the two sides of the same coin. You cannot have liberty if you and the people at large do not practice character. Liberty is the one social arrangement, in fact, that requires that we live to high standards of, of character. If you don't, sooner or later, you and others will descend into some kind of authoritarianism. Can you imagine a society of free people who are also a dishonest people, uh, who don't keep the word, who lie at every turn, uh, who are lied to by their leaders uh, nonstop. Uh, that, that's the kind of situation that produces chaos, out of which you get a strong man who uh, knocks heads together to bring order, and there go your liberties. And other character traits that are essential for liberty to arise and to be sustained are things like uh, responsibility, uh, self-discipline, courage, you got to have courage because the world is full of people and always has been who would be happy to take your liberty uh, at the drop of a hat if they thought they could do it. So if you believe in it, you've got to uh, stand up for it and defend it, sometimes give your life for it. Um, those are important character attributes, and if you don't have them, if you think short-term, if you're not uh, humble, if you think you know it all, that you can plan other people's lives, if you're uh, a liar, if you're irresponsible, if you expect that other people should uh, compensate you for the poor judgments you've made in life, all of that is a prescription for chaos, uh, for dependency rather than independence and strong people. And that gives rise, uh, all of these uh, things give rise to uh, 
harmful trends that uh, cannot sustain liberty. You talked about poor judgment. This is something that goes back to, to Clinton, right? Because this, I don't know when it started. Maybe they had it back in Rome. Maybe there were people picketing saying, you know, who are you to judge? Don't judge. This is judgmental society. And it got such a bad rap. But Clinton's meme and the soundbite was, look, what he does in his private life and his personal life are two totally different things that aren't related. And you can still be an effective leader regardless of what you do once you take your tie off. Maybe I'm the deranged one, but to me, that's insanity. And it's hilarious. And it's an easy way to convince people that not only is his behavior acceptable, but your own. And that's a problem. Yeah, that's tantamount to saying, uh, I was not faithful to my wife, but trust me, I'll be faithful to other people, to the country. Uh, you know, I, I just don't think that uh, you can separate the two. The personal character is very important. Uh, but aside from the uh, sexual indiscretions that he was guilty of, uh, I have a real problem with the fact that he committed perjury uh, and that he used the power of his office to uh, uh, try to silence uh, or disparage uh, one of one, at least one of the women uh, that he abused. And, uh, you know, that, there you go beyond just uh, private life. Uh, experiences and actions and get into uh, public acts as a public uh, official. And I think those actions were reprehensible. So going back to the small percentage, I want to talk about something I don't know much about, but I've been reading it in the as far as Roman times. In the American Revolution, I read books that talk about how few people there were compared to the, you know, there were a lot of fence sitters, a lot of people who were perfectly happy letting the British uh, raise taxes, cause commotion, you know, beat them down, so to speak. Nowadays, if you're on social media, you said a lot of these movements are referring to themselves as the 3%, which is what they estimate was the amount of people willing to make the ultimate sacrifice to have freedom. Uh, do, you think there's, do you think that's an accurate number? It, was that what it was in Rome? I mean, how many people would stand up and say, you know what, this isn't going to work out. We're, we're killing ourselves. This is slow suicide. Well, I have no idea what that number is today, but I have a feeling that it's uh, not as high as it once was. And I can tell you that in ancient Rome, uh, though that there was once a day when, uh, in ancient Rome, when people uh, would, in great numbers, put their lives on the line, uh, they castigated uh, any uh, office seeker who seemed to be uh, willing to sacrifice the Roman Constitution for expediency. Uh, but all of that uh, slowly dissolved, and by uh, the late first century BC. People were more interested in getting what they could for the moment from the politicians in the way of a handout than they were in uh, defending the liberties that gave them uh, great wealth uh, in the first place. I just looked it up because I, I botched the description, but it's a loose affiliation of like-minded Americans who vow to comply with laws that violate the Second Amendment. The name 3 percenter comes from the fact that only 3% of colonial British subjects took up arms against the king during the Revolutionary War. 3% of the population was enough to overthrow a government and win their independence. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that would mean that the other 97 were indifferent or on the other side. Uh, everybody has their own threshold, uh, you know, just how much uh, tyranny or, or danger they will tolerate before they take an action. Uh, thankfully, 3% or whatever it was uh, met that threshold and met the challenge and we're free today. But... Uh, uh, I would guess an awful lot of others were sympathetic. They just hadn't got to the point where they were willing to pick up arms and uh, join the fight. I want to ask you a question about something that I see in, with fellow Christians where you get into a debate. And the main reason I started the show, actually, to be honest, between the both of us is because as you feel like you start to grasp certain concepts and see things for what they are, especially in my case, learning about you know, Alinskyites. Let me give an example. I had a friend the other day who, an acquaintance, who runs a Twitter feed that basically throws Democratic talking points out all day long. And he's got his 50,000 Twitter followers, and he's super proud of it. He's a Christian, and I was talking to him about Barack Obama's, you know, relationship with Saul Alinsky and what Saul stood for. And then obviously we had to talk about him dedicating his book to Lucifer, the first radical. And before we got to that, I asked him what he felt about Saul Alinsky, and he goes, well, who's that? And here's a guy who's probably the most, <laughs> this is going to sound bad, but I guess it is true, the, the most informed liberal Democrat that I come across on a, on a regular basis. And he didn't know who Saul Alinsky was. So when I told him, I go, that's basically the equivalent of me saying, well, you know, Christians are all idiots and they're judgmental and bigoted. And, and then someone could say, so you don't believe in Jesus? And I go, well, well, who's that? Who are you referring to? 
I mean, that's how far off base I felt like he was. What confuses me is when people get to know more about what they believe in and they still side with those policies. Harry Reid is a good example, but for even for people who believe the same way that I do, who have the same values and morals, and they use the they do what the Catholic Church has done, where they use the Christian doctrine and principles to say, look, you have to do what's best for people, even if it goes against the laws that you live by. You have to extend a helping hand to the point where they basically, you, you harm them and you make them dependent. And where do, you, where do we draw the line as believers on helping versus hurting? Well, but I think what begins, we have to understand that the, though the Bible has many references to the importance of lending a helping hand, you know, there's no passage in the Bible that says, anything like it is the proper function of government to get that job done by taking from some and giving to others. Remember the famous story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, I was recently confronted by an interviewer who said, well, look at that. Uh, The Bible talks about uh, the the man who uh, extended a helping hand to another who was down and out in the gutter. So therefore, uh, the Bible, you know, is, uh, sanctions the welfare state, and they had to point out to him that that is quite a quite a stretch uh, of an interpretation. If that good Samaritan had said in response to the man in need, uh, "Here, here's the phone number for your congressman. Call and get it from him," we would hardly remember him as a good Samaritan. He was good precisely because he pitched in with his own resources and provided assistance. He didn't expect the politicians. Uh, to do it. Uh, also, I, I think our Christian friends from Lean Left should understand that uh, within the Ten Commandments we have the proviso that uh, thou shalt not steal. It does not say thou shalt not steal unless the other guy has more than you do, or thou shalt not, uh, thou shalt not steal unless you're absolutely sure that you can spend it better than the guy who earned it himself, or thou shalt not steal unless you hire a politician to do it for you. Uh, So, uh, And there was an occasion when Christ himself was confronted by a man. Uh, This is accounted for in Luke 12, 13 through 15. The man says to Jesus, uh, Master, speak to my brother that he divideth the inheritance with me. In other words, hey, redistribute the wealth a bit uh, on my behalf. And Christ's reply was, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? In other words, don't, don't look to me to take from somebody and give to you. That's not my, even though I'm the son of God, that's not my job. That's above his pay grade is what he's saying, right? Where have we heard that before? Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people read too much, uh, or they read uh, the wrong things into the Bible. They, they, they see uh, the, the notion of helping others as a good one, and then from there they leap to the conclusion that that's what politicians should do. But that takes away the personal aspect of charity. It's no longer charity if uh, you simply tell a politician to do it instead of you. I think that's one of the biggest problems I have with homeschooling being ripped on. You know, them trying to stamp it out is that it forces the people teaching to be educated and have an incentive to know a lot more than the students about what's going on. So when we outsource that to the teachers' unions, uh, we're dumbing down the kids and the parents. Yeah, that's right. And homeschooling has been such a fantastic success uh, in this country, that it's it's very hard anymore for the old stereotypes to get any headway. Uh, the homeschooled students are routinely accepted, eagerly sought after, in fact, by some of our best universities. Uh, they score well on uh, on standardized tests. They're among the champions at uh, in various academic contests, and they certainly are almost never involved in any kind of. Uh, Anti-social unrest uh, or, or problems of that nature. All the all the arguments that we used to hear about uh, kids being homeschooled are not very uh, socialized. Uh, they don't know how to you know react to in the presence of others. That's uh, if that was ever true at all. Uh, it certainly isn't today. Yeah, you mean all those headlines about the homeschooling kids that were defecating on cop cars and, and raping girls during Occupy Wall Street? I remember that. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, every time I hear of a student riot, uh, like after a big football game, I think to myself, oh, there go the homeschoolers again. Uh, but just as a joke. Yeah, they should be in the kitchen studying algebra. What are they doing out of class? <laughs> yeah, well, I, the, one of the bright spots on our horizon, I think, is homeschooling. I think it's it's got a great future, and uh, 
uh, hope and pray every day that more parents will find uh, with, find it within themselves to take their kids out of government schools and get the job done uh, themselves. You know, I don't know if there's a term for it, but essentially the the fact that men's best laid plans, especially evil men, always have cracks in them. They can't account for everything, and especially when it comes to what God's plan is. I think about it all the time. Like One of the arguments that comes up for people that I know that are Christian is with if they support illegal immigration and how about how we're one big family and you know families don't have walls and I hear these things that are just haven't been thought through at all. But then you have instances like Ebola, and this is a stretch too, but I, you know, when you have global warming and Al Gore goes to Copenhagen and it has the coldest day on record in 50 years, and you say, you know, the guy has a sense of humor. He gets a chuckle out of this too, I think. So we got to laugh along with him. But then with amnesty, you know, they basically, people get Ebola, it breaks out in Africa, and all of a sudden people, whether they are political or not, are thinking, wait a minute, maybe it's not a good idea to let several hundred thousand people from South America just run over the border and have border patrol you know, changing diapers instead of keeping infidels and drug users and all these other bad people from coming into our seas. Have you given much thought to the, the providence and forethought of God when it comes to, you know, shaping events in that nature? Well, I think ultimately, as a Christian, uh, I, I believe that God is in control. Uh, we have a lot of uh, opportunities to exercise our judgments and our free will, but ultimately uh, uh, we're under his, his sway and his control. Uh, but we prove every day that we are a fallen people. Uh, it's so difficult uh, to uh, sustain liberty because character tends to erode when people discover uh, the temptations of power and the temptations of a welfare state. So, uh, you know, it's a struggle. It really is. But that's uh, what we were told it would be from the very beginning. As far as the timeline, Rome fell in 500 years. Are we on an accelerated scale? Or are we are we uh, are we pacing them, or are we drifting them? Well, I think we've uh, gone further in uh, a bad direction in the last hundred years than Rome did in its last two or three hundred, perhaps. But you know, there are no precise parallels, uh, so it's hard to say where this thing is going. It may uh, continue the decline in fits and starts. But I'm an optimist, frankly. I. I firmly believe that although so many trends these days are in the wrong direction, uh, I firmly believe that Americans will come to their senses. If I didn't think that they will or could, I guess I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing at the Foundation for Economic Education. We're trying to counter these trends uh, by uh, teaching sound economics and uh, personal character. I have every confidence that at some point, I don't know when, Americans will come to their senses and realize that uh, we cannot continue to travel the path of, of uh, a massive government, debt, overspending, deficits, and the erosion of personal character, that we've got to clean up our act or, or we'll lose our civilization. What's your singer's greatest source of optimism from your bird's eye view? When you go out and give speeches, when you're lecturing, what is it that gives you the most hope? I think it's young people these days, and maybe that's because we at Fee focus on young people. I have seen a tremendous uh, interest uh, and a growing interest among young people in ideas of liberty just in the last few years, uh, partly because they're beginning to understand that uh, this hope and change and promises of transparency of the Obama administration were all uh, deception and illusion, and now they're looking for other answers. And uh, they're very uh, open to ideas of, of individual empowerment instead of uh, giving power to politicians. I know that when it comes to our summer programs, uh, the demand for them from students all over the country is just going through the roof. And as much as we grow, we can't uh, seem to, to meet that demand. And once students hear these ideas, they're fired up about them. So I'm very optimistic that the younger generations uh, in America may, in fact, uh, be pivotal in turning things around in the next few decades. Well, Mr. Reed, it's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on. I know I've learned a lot, and I've, I find that the more that I learn about these parallels, the more of desire that I have to just completely dive into them and to have an ability to see the tea leaves turning and see where we're going and what we can learn from history and how to not repeat it. So thank you. If people want to, which I'm sure they will, go and learn more about you and, and also dive into more of the, the content you produce, where can they find you? They should go to our website, which is fee, F-E-E, dot org. There you'll find uh, almost 70 years of uh, commentary, and not all from me. I'm not that old, but 
uh, we've <laughs> we've archived uh, material that Fee has been producing since the 1950s. So I encourage people to visit the website. If they're on social media, we have a Fee uh, Facebook page. I have a Facebook page. I encourage people to uh, give it a look and like it if they uh, care to. And uh, uh, that would be a great start. They can learn all about Fee, about Rome, uh, and these other things that we've talked about uh, if they visit the website. Thank you so much. It's our republic if we can keep it. So thanks for doing your part. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you, TJ. You're listening to the absolute unadulterated truth, courtesy of the Oh Hail Yeah Show. Want more? Oh. Hail Yeah, you do. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to the Young Cons podcast on iTunes or SoundCloud. And make sure to check us out online at youngcons.com slash podcast. Or chat us up on Twitter at RealTJHale. But I'm a big fan of money. I like it. I use it. I have a little. I keep it in a jar on top of my refrigerator. I'd like to put more in that jar. That's where you come in.